concurrent breakout sessions. Um, we'll, we'll have both at the same time partnership and collaboration with people with lived experience of homelessness and responding to inequity in your data. Then we will all come back together um, for understanding and improving the experience of Black and Indigenous people and other people of color who interact with the homelessness system. Finally, on Friday, we'll be together again for our closing plenary, taking action to move the needle on equity, and we've saved a little time for celebrating there too. So I'm guessing that most of you have already accessed the Sketch platform that holds all things learning session, otherwise you wouldn't be here right now. Um, so this will be your hub for this, the schedule, your Zoom links, and any supplementary materials that go along with the sessions. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Garen to better orient you to that platform and to some of the other tools that we'll be using during the learning session. Hey, Garen? Anna, before, yeah. before we hop over, I just want to let you know that a bunch of people are, the slides are blurry for some folks. Um, I don't know what that is, but it's a little better with the sketch, but they're all a little blurry. It was hard to read the last one. Okay. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, let's see. Um, Jake said maybe restart present mode. Okay. This gives me a chance to see all your faces. <laughs> All right, I reloaded there. Let's uh, let's keep an eye on whether that fixes the problem as we keep moving forward. All right, Garen, you want to take it over? Sure. Thanks. Um, so, Nate, I'm going to share my screen. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we were going to refresh the present anyway. <laughs> Maybe I should have piped up with that. Um, okay. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I just, I just want to orient you all to Sketch and then a couple of other tools. Um, <clears throat> so here is Sketch. A lot of you have been in here. Um, this is sort of your landing page. Once you log in, it shows you all of the sessions that are available. Um, if you click into an event, so I'm going to click into this one, um, you can either join it in right here in the browser with this little Zoom function here, or if you hit this yellow button, you can just open Zoom and it'll open like a separate Zoom window on your computer. Um, if you scroll down, there are lots of other goodies in here. So you've got, um, so there are three or actually two, but like two formats of one. Um, materials for this session. Um, there's a worksheet, there are these swag cards, um, which I'll describe a little bit more in a second. Then you can also see everybody who's registered for this session. Um, and this is also a little plug to everyone. If you haven't uploaded a picture, if you haven't updated your profile, um, that stuff will show up here. Um, so yeah, just everybody do it. We'd love to see your faces all the time, not just in these sessions. And the way to do that is to, um, if you click on your face, um, you can hit edit profile right here and you can update all your stuff. So this is a place where you can see where you can add your contact information. You can decide to make it available to others. Okay, you can say something about here. yourself, et cetera. Every day, Friday, Saturday, 10 to six. It's going to put it right at 40 hours this week. So, um, we can hit somebody who's talking right now is not muted. So if everybody would just take a second and mute themselves, that would be great. Um, so, okay, now I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to orient you to a couple of other items. Um, so, Nate, if you could put the slides back up. <laughs> um, so, okay, one of the materials that was shared in these, um, in the, um, in this session is these reaction cards. So these are super fun ways that if you have your video turned on, you can sort of like tell us what you're thinking. Um, so we've got an LOL. If somebody tells like a super hilarious joke, 
Um, if you're like dying to get off mute, you can say unmute me, please. Um, you can give a thumbs up. <laughs> you can say plus one if you agree with somebody. You can say way to go. If, if somebody did something great and is doing a great job, feel free to put this one up right now to tell me how great a job I'm doing explaining the reaction cards. Um, so <clears throat> if you got a swag box, these sort of these cards are included in there. If you did not, or if it hasn't arrived yet, you can print out the cards that are included in um, they're included in this session in this in the materials for this session. Um, okay, so next slide, Nate. So one other thing also in the materials for this session is this reflection tool. So I, um, we're kind of encouraging everybody to use this tool to sort of gather their thoughts throughout the day, throughout all the sessions. Um, and this is a place, so there are four sections on here, observations. So anything that you notice, um, anything that you learn, anything someone says that you wanna remember would be an observation. Insights, any aha moments, um, something that you learned for the first time, something that's kind of a light bulb that's going off questions, um, self-explanatory, anything that's still unclear, anything you want to kind of follow up about, and then next steps. Um, what are, so this one is kind of specially highlighted. What are some actions you plan to take? Um, at the end of the day on each day, we're going to ask you to kind of regroup with your team. And that's a good time for you all to sort of decide on next steps based on some of the things that you observed or learned during the day. Um, and then I have one more slide, I think. Nate. Okay, so you sketch for everything except for one session this afternoon. So it's called Committing to End Homelessness, Committing to Each Other. It's 3.30 to 5 o'clock today. Um, if you registered for this session, you have a separate calendar invite for this session from someone on our team. Um, if you don't have that calendar invite, you should email these folks. Um, yes, Beth. 3.30 to 5 Eastern. Um, you should email these folks here, Caitlin and Eddie, and they will figure it out and set you up. Um, to answer Thomas's question, so it is, um, if you go into the event for the opening plenary and you scroll all the way down, it'll be one of the materials that's linked in there. And I think that's it. So it's back to... Anna slash Tamara. I believe that you're next. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, so I wanna take a moment to welcome our collaborators. Um, Regina Cannon, the Chief Equity and Impact Officer at C4 Innovations. Yolanda Rory, uh, co-director and founding faculty, People with Lived Experience Institute. Donald Whitehead, president of the board of directors for the National Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, Bernice Ramalla, co-director and founding faculty, People with Lived Experience Institute. And Kavita Singh Gilchrist, co-founder of Racial Equity Partners. And here we are now, guys. Um, I know that some of you have probably been with Built for Zero for a very long time, and we're just a movement that continues to grow. And now we have 84 communities in Built for Zero, and together we've made just enormous strides in this work to end homelessness. We've housed over 125,000 individuals. 79 of our communities have real-time data. 48 have made measurable reductions and 13 communities have ended veteran or chronic homelessness. And I just feel like that's outstanding and y'all deserve um, a round of applause and all the accolades for being so wonderful. Next slide, please. And we'd also like to welcome uh, some new Built for Zero communities. Woohoo! Reaction cards should come up now. Um, Yamal County, Oregon. If you're somewhere out there, please say, hey, that's me and we're in the chat. Um, Clark County, Washington. Woohoo! Way to go! Mm -hmm. uh, San Diego, Colorado Balance Estate, Pueblo, which is actually where my dad's from, and Baltimore County um, COC. Welcome to Built for Zero. Welcome to the team. We're so happy to have you. Um, and next slide, please. 
And now we're going to hear from some of our staff members about why they think the, the work in racial equity is so important and why we are centering a lot of our uh, work going forward around this. Um, so take it away, Nate. I think like many of you, there have been a lot of times that I've asked myself, you know, what more can I be doing? How contribute to a more equitable society? I think we have to stop pretending it's an accident that some people are more likely to experience homelessness than other people. And what inspires me in thinking about focusing on race equity is that we're focusing not just on users, but on users for whom the system hasn't worked particularly well. Home for Zero has to focus on creating equitable systems because we can't end homelessness without doing it. Looking at our data over time has been one way that we've created shared, transparent conversations around goals, progress, and obstacles. And I hope we can take a similar approach to shine a flashlight on inequities and work to improve them. As Built for Zero is shifting to center racial equity in our work, um, I'm most excited about what we're going to learn from our communities. Uh, there are a lot of people connected to the Built for Zero movement who've been doing racial justice work for years. Change agents like yourselves who already know how to do this work, already know how to move through the tough challenges, already know how to move forward even when you can't clearly see the path for how you'll get there. My commitment is to continue helping to amplify the stories of communities doing that work, to help disseminate the learning so that we can all take steps forward toward a more racially equitable society. I know this work is going to be scary and it's going to be a new territory to enter for most of you, but just as words of encouragement, be patient with yourself, be patient with others, teamwork, stay positive, and know at the end of the day, we will all get through this. If we lean in with love, compassion, and conviction, our movement can get us closer to the just system that we truly deserve. We've done hard things. We can do hard things. And we'll do them together. Thank you, Nate. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, safe spaces and liberated spaces and the difference between the two and why we're so focused on creating a liberated space. You know, in this work, I feel like we're going to be talking a lot about foundational aspects of what we need to do to really end homelessness. And part of that is really just building trust in a community. I feel like, you know, much like a relationship, that's kind of what we are here too. You know, we're all having these relationships with each other. We're all trying to work together to meet this audacious goal. And in order to build trust, we have to have, you know, some sort of foundational liberated space. And so that's kind of why we've consciously made a transition from what we first called a safe place into um, a liberated space. And let me just talk a little bit about that. Um, so first just saying, you know, this is a safe place doesn't actually make it a safe place if people don't feel that way. So um, just because um, a, somebody's leading this and they're like, oh, you're, you're safe here. If somebody doesn't feel comfortable and there's not like agreed upon norms that everybody um, can feel very devoted to, then it might not feel safe and it might not feel very good for everybody. And because you know, whiteness is the dominant culture of America and whiteness loves comfort, when a situation is uncomfortable, we try to enforce safety and enforce comfort. And that can really be to the detriment of our community members and to building that trust and to making sure people actually do feel safe and liberated in this work while they're, while they're you know, trying to, to challenge each other and hold each other accountable. And so that's kind of why we must make this conscious effort to shift from working within that safe space to a liberated space. And liberated spaces are those where we commit to participate fully, even when the conversations are uncomfortable. And we know that conversations about racism in America are not comfortable. We are not going to run away from that. We are going to show up, we're going to do the work and we're gonna restore what has been broken. In the liberated space model of community, we all come up with norms and rules and responsibilities together and abide by them in good faith. These agreements are made with love and compassion, really centered in that. And whatever agreements we enter on, we will do so very consensually, making sure everybody's on board and it's not something we're talking them into. We want you to be enthusiastic about, you know, being able to be free in this space and, and hold people accountable and have a, a degree of trust. And because those agreements will help pave the road for making our goals and aims actually into a reality, 
And if there's a bump in the road, we're going to stop and talk about it. Always keeping in mind, you know, how does this affect my community? Not just me, not just my agency, but everyone around me. How does this relate to the hopes and dreams of my community and ending homelessness and achieving these aims? And what is my part in this story? And setting up these community guidelines will reflect what the whole community values as fair, just, and theirs, you know, taking ownership of what happens here. So when individuals feel like they have ownership of what they uh, can do and say, and when those things are rooted in fairness, justice, and love, people will go above and beyond in order to keep themselves and each other accountable for the well-being of the group. Uh, next slide, please. So again, a liberated space. Um, I saw this, I read this in a Medium article a couple days ago, and I thought it was really great. So I did not come up with this. This is from the author in the previous slide, but he says a liberated space is a lot like a fertile community garden for seeds to emerge from the soil to grow. And people can grow in profound ways when they are free. In liberated spaces, we struggle together. We are committed to one another. We mess up. We process together, we apologize, we learn, and we live together. It's just what life is, right? You make mistakes, you fail, you learn from them, and then you don't do it again. So groups growing into that liberated space can cultivate trust among one another, honor intentions, and provide feedback in a way that is honest and holds people accountable while also giving room for people to grow and be better. And I really think that accountability piece is just such an important part of building trust uh, I really feel like if you're not able to be transparent and hold people accountable, that trust aspect is just going to be really hard to attain. Um, so again, it's we're rooted in community and love. We're looking out for one another. We want to work as a team to learn and to grow and restore that which has been broken. And in these spaces, we're free to bring our true selves, our whole selves, take risks, make mistakes. Um, free to be uncomfortable and uh, to hold tension in life-giving ways. And so that's kind of what we're really wanting to um, promote today is just really trying to exist in that liberated space. Next slide, please. So um, I would like y'all to participate in the chat if you could on what would it take to feel like you're bringing your whole self, your vulnerability and your willingness to be held accountable to learn and grow what would that look like to you? What would that feel like to you? Maybe take a minute to think about it. And something else that might help you think through this is like really thinking about your values and how working in a liberated space would tie directly to your values and how your values show up in your work. So for me, that would be something like I'm, a, I'm big on accountability. So accountability and equity are my values. How is that going to translate into this liberated space? Okay, I see compassionate responses when, oh, when there are bumpy points or conflict. Yes, exactly. Own your own experience and let others have theirs. Yes. Transparency and an ethical mindset. Yes, I like that. Lots of transparency on here. Self-awareness. Oh, I like authenticity, compassion, and presence. Yes, it's very important to just not be somebody that's just showing up to the work group and not actually participating or, or um, bringing yourself or your experiences or your thoughts. Not judging, yes. Intent versus impact. Mm -hmm. Transparency, lots of transparency. That's so important, right? You just can't build trust without knowing what's going on, without people trusting you enough to share with what's going on. You know, I just think that's so important. All right, these are great guys. Free of judgment, self-aware, willing to learn and accept others, responding without defensiveness. That's such a big one. It's so hard sometimes when you're in this work, I think that we get so attached to processes that we start to like think that they're ours and take take the work personally when it's it's not you, it's the process, you know, and, and trying to differentiate that with folks. Uh, quoting Brene Brown, I'm not here to be right, I'm here to get it right. Yes, yes, like that. I love Brene Brown. Being consistent, owning your privilege. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thank you guys so much. That's, that's wonderful. 
Um, now we're going to hand it over to Leslie Wise and Jessica Venegas to talk a little bit more about committing to racial equity. Thanks. Thank you, Tamara. It's so good to see everybody. I mean, it'd be really awesome if we could be in person, but I'll take this. And it's just such a good reminder to see all your faces. I know that you all are doing the hard work every day, but but seeing your faces and knowing that you're out there just reminds me of that so important and really moving. So hi, everybody. I am Leslie Wise. Um, I have the great privilege of working at Community Solutions. I'm part of the Built for Zero team. Um, I'm really excited to spend some time with you today over the next couple of days at our first virtual learning session. Um, so let's start with what we know. Anna made it clear in her opening remarks, Native and Black Americans are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. And it's not an accident. It's not by chance. The overrepresentation of Black and Native Americans in the homeless population is the result of historic and ongoing racism, particularly in the housing policies that we've all seen evolve over the last hundreds of years. Um, although it's been apparent to us now for some time, we started leaning into the empirical data together as a movement um, almost three years ago at a Built for Zero learning session, one that we were together in person, not virtual. Um, we were joined, if you all remember and were with us, by uh, the SPARC leaders from C4SI. They shared some emerging data on race and homelessness that we all leaned into and spent some time together uh, learning. Um, but what we need to talk about today is that the system we point to as the system to end homelessness and that most of us probably touch in one way or another has not been designed to identify or respond to the racial disparities we know exist. So we shouldn't be surprised to find therefore that the system continues to, re uh, to reproduce and deepen these disparities. And so about a year ago, and with many of you and with people who have lived experience of homelessness and other key partners to this movement, we set out to identify key indicators that signal a homeless response system that is racially equitable. We've had hours of conversations and probably spent double that amount of time iterating early versions so that this week we could share those indicators with you. The commitment you're making to be a part of this movement to end homelessness is now also a movement that acknowledges the inequities in our current system and deliberately and directly works to dismantle the parts that create these results. And it's a commitment to showing up, to learn from each other, to share what you know, and to continue to grow personally and professionally along the way. But you're not gonna do it alone, we promise. You're part of a movement, right? You're part of a movement made up of hundreds of other leaders working to end homelessness and improve the homeless response systems. And you have the Built for Zero team. You have us and all of our strategic partners who will hold ourselves accountable to making sure you have the support you need to be successful. In fact, the content we designed and embedded into this virtual learning session today and tomorrow is intended to be the first step in providing that support. And tomorrow, we're actually gonna walk you through the indicators themselves and the measurement infrastructure for a racially equitable homeless response system in some more detail. So please join us for that. We also acknowledge, and we've said it, Anna has said, I think Tamara as well, that most organizations joining us today, and for many of you personally, this isn't day one. It's not the first step you're taking to address racial justice in your work and in your lives. And like you, Community Solutions has been doing this work. We still have a lot of work to do, but we're starting to make progress. And Jessica, you wanna talk a little bit about um, our journey? Yes, thanks. Well, hi everyone. Um, as someone who has been with Community Solutions since day one, I, I know and I'm so happy to be in this community and in this tribe with all of you. And especially um, now in this, crazy time we hold on to each other even more. Um, so we are at an inflection point around racial justice in the United States. The multiple crises that 2020 has brought, the global health pandemic, the economic collapse, and the racial tension that have made the work of racial equity more urgent than ever. Our racial equity journey did not begin in 2020 though. I'm here to talk to you about our CS journey on racial equity, but I should really touch on the journey that we've been on together with you. It starts with Terrence Crutcher. He was killed by police two weeks before we arrived in Tulsa. 
And here we are landing in Tulsa where 99 years ago, Black Wall Street was burned to the ground and 36 black people were killed. We got there and we arrived there with all of you and realized in partnership with our partners there, the Mental Health Association, that we could not, not acknowledge that, not acknowledge Terrence's life and the community that we were in. So we held space together during our time in Tulsa. And um, as we closed out that conference, you might remember we heard from Melissa Harris Perry and she spoke to us about the moral imperative that we not be bystanders in the fight for racial justice. Tulsa was an important step. Our team left energized but uncertain and dug into our organizational racial equity plan. And as you can see on the slide, our, our timeline, and I'll let you read it, I, I'm not gonna read slides to you, but you can see that much of the work we took on um, got laid out in the slide. We took steps internally and we started to take steps, steps externally as well. We began hearing data from the SPARC study documenting the profound racial disparities related to homelessness. So we brought those team members to you at learning sessions in Denver and New Orleans that year. Another step. At our conference in Detroit, we expanded our racial equity focus to include a track on battling systemic racism. I had the honor personally of sitting on a couch in front of many of you. You guys remember that big white couch <laughs> where I couldn't see the timer? Um, I had the honor of sitting on a couch in front of many of you in conversation with Patrice Cullors, the founder of Black Lives Matter. Patrice challenged us to connect our housing justice work with the larger racial justice movement. Detroit was an important step. Following that learning session, our team did an intensive training on racial equity at a retreat center in Orlando in order to deepen our knowledge and skills to combat racism to shape both our internal and external aims as we move into strategic planning, and it grounded us in the work we're undertaking with you today. As an organization, our racial equity work is not new, and it's not finished, and we're not doing it alone. We're part of a national racial equity working group, which includes other national partners and our government partners. We're supported by amazing partners in this work, equally committed to racial justice, some of which you're gonna hear from over the next few days. So I'm gonna close uh, with a video from our partners. We are really fortunate to have funding partners who are committed to this. Um, and before I do, um, and hand it back to Leslie with the video, I just wanna say thank you to all of you for your courage and your sustained commitment. Let us never be bystanders. As the nation's largest mortgage lender, Rocket Mortgage has not only the tools, but also the responsibility to be investing in racially equitable housing systems and supports. Through the Built for Zero movement, we can focus on outcomes. Together, we break down broken systems and we hold ourselves accountable to nothing less than zero. That is the only way that we can build more equitable systems for our neighbors that produce real results. And it's also why Rocket Mortgage is a proud partner alongside each and every one of you with the Built for Zero movement. Hi, I'm John Boo from Kaiser Permanente. And as being part of a large health system whose mission is committed to improving health in our communities, we know that addressing people's housing needs is paramount and essential to good health. And we know that if we're gonna find solutions in this area, we need to go beyond just the technical, beyond issues of just data or better integration of services, but to really think about and look at underlying causes, think about the upstream factors. And given the disparate impact of homelessness in our society, we know that we need to confront systemic racism. And so we are committed to keeping this at the center of our work, uh, continue to listen and engage leaders and communities in this space, looking at the evidence and the research and seeing where that may point us, and then continuing to be good partners with innovators like Community Solutions. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Jeff Edmondson from Bomber Group. Just wanna take a minute to thank you for all you are doing, in the, especially in these unprecedented times. Uh, we are supporting Community Solutions because of people like you that are taking uh, an intentional data-driven uh, approach to making sure that the that those who need supports the most have high quality resources at their fingertips and we want to continue supporting communities to apply uh, the same rigorous approach here applying to those 
uh, who are homeless right now to make sure that uh, we go upstream and address issues like evictions and uh, mental health issues that cause homelessness in the first place. And our hope is, is that by doing so, we can directly address the racial disparities uh, that we know are so pervasive uh, at this time. Um, and so just thank you for what you're doing and we look forward to the journey ahead. Hi everyone, Jason here from Tableau Foundation. Data can be a powerful tool in the fight against hate and ignorance. We support Built for Zero because we want everyone here to have access to the best quality data possible and for you to be able to use it in the fight for more equitable systems, programs, and communities. Thank you for your constant efforts and we support you in your work. As the nation's largest mortgage lender, Rocket Mortgage. All right. Okay, so what lays ahead Built for Zero movement is a shared commitment to using a framework that begins to measure if the changes we're making and the actions we're taking locally and across the country are resulting in better outcomes for our homeless neighbors who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. You are justice leaders. Ending homelessness is social justice work. But racial justice has not been centered in what we do to achieve this universal goal. So Built for Zero is now a movement commit committed to centering racial justice in our work to end homelessness. We're asking each community that's part of this movement to do the same. Our Built for Zero federal partners always show up. We just heard from some of our strategic and um, strategic partners and funders. Um, but it's really important to acknowledge the support and the ongoing support year after year of our federal partners. They show up for us here at Built for Zero and for the movement, offering support and guidance um, as we collectively work to end homelessness and now as we center racial justice in this work. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Uh, we're going to start with Beverly Ebersold. She's the Director of National Initiatives at the U.S. Interagency Council on Homeless, Homelessness. Sean Liu, hi Sean. Um, he is the community. He's the community engagement coordinator at uh, with the VHA Homeless Programs Office at the VA, and Lisa Kaufman. Uh, she's the senior program specialist in the Office of Special Needs Assistance Programs at HUD. So I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you so much for being with us and for your ongoing dedication and support of this movement. Great. Um, thank you, Leslie. And uh, thanks to the entire community solutions team and all of the Built for Zero community partners that are here today. It's super exciting to, to see your faces. And I think, you know, for USICH and particularly for myself, appreciate the opportunity to continue to support your collective work in ending homelessness. Uh, for those of you who, who may not know me, um, my name is Beverly Ebersold. I am the director of the National Initiatives Team at USICH. We are a small but mighty team uh, based in the field across the country. Um, I'm based in Detroit, Michigan, and I have team members in Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Santa Barbara in Seattle. Um, I encourage all of you, if you don't know those regional coordinators to get a chance to get to know them, they're wonderful um, resources. And again, you know, I think just being so grateful and appreciative of all of you and the work that you're, you're doing in these unprecedented times. And so I wanted to share a few thoughts from USICH before I kind of have some uh, Q&A with my, my federal friends, uh, Sean and Lisa. Um, and wanted to talk about where, where USICH is on our work with um, racial justice. And so racial disparities and experiences of homelessness are clear <laughs> and stark, driven, by a complex, uh, driven by a complex array of inequities within our systems and social dynamics, biases and prejudices, overt discrimination, systemic and institutional racism, and many other related and intersectional forces that impact our response to homelessness and collectively help cause and create homelessness in our country. If we as a nation, okay, and, and uh, someone's got a cause. <laughs> um, if we um, as a nation are going to end homelessness, we must focus our efforts on achieving racial equity, not just in our local homelessness services systems, but also across the systems that can affect people's ability to stay stably housed. 
USICH and our federal and national partners recognize the need for communities to address racial inequities that exist across the experiences of homelessness and to support partnerships uh, to build anti-racist communities. Um, and in order to understand the dynamics underpinning these inequities and develop local solutions, communities must ground their work in data and collect and examine both quantitative and qualitative data. And at USICH, it is important that we're gonna continue to highlight that work that you are all leading in communities and lift it up and promote it nationally. We can build a future where everyone in our country has a fair and equal opportunity, which begins with a place to call home. USICH staff are committed to addressing systemic racism in the work of ending homelessness and will continue lifting that work up in ongoing partnership of communities, leaders, national organizations, and to keep that conversation going with federal agencies. These partnerships, if you, as you've heard today, are uh, in collaboration are critical in holding each other accountable and USICH is looking forward to supporting and learning alongside of you and with all of you. So now I want to I want to turn it over to a couple of my federal friends. Um, I think I'm going to kick it off over to to Lisa um, from our, our SNAPS office over at at HUD and hear a little bit from Lisa. You know how 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 you guys at HUD um, are committed to the work of addressing systemic racism in the work to end homelessness. So I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. All right, Beth, thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague, April Mitchell, from the SNAPS office. Uh, so I'm actually going to turn uh, this question over to April so you can hear from her. Hi, thank you, Lisa. And thank you to everybody that's on the call. We um, are definitely committed to working with um, this organization and really happy that we were invited to be on this call. So SNAPS is actually committed to addressing racial disparities in the homelessness system to ensure that those who are disproportionately homeless and are at risk of homelessness are being adequately served by the homeless system. Um, so in all SNAPS recognizes the need for all communities to better understand and address the overrepresentation of people of color among all of those that are experiencing homelessness. So we're definitely um, committed to work on addressing um, all the issues with systematic racism um, in the homelessness sector. And I think Lisa wanted to talk a little bit about uh, supporting communities. Yeah, did you, were you gonna uh, let Sean respond to that too? Oh yes, I'm sorry, Sean, go right on. <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> I have a very patient dude and pretty much everybody on this call knows if you give me the mic, I'm gonna talk way too long. Hey everybody, Sean from Department of Veterans Affairs, really excited to be with you all today. Uh, just like old times, we're all here together again. Fantastic. Definitely, we at the VA National Homeless Program Office are 100% committed to racial equity, racial justice, and making sure that our homeless programs are anti-racist in the services that we provide to veterans. Why, of course? Well, you've heard a lot of reasons already, and I just want to echo them here, that essentially, when we think about the work that we've done and the 50% reduction that we made in veteran homelessness since 2010, it's huge. It's amazing. I'm excited. You all were a part of it as well, and we still have 50% more to go. And if you think about it really closely, and it's not, this, is, this is not my original idea, but when we look at other similar things to prevent and end, you can't end coronavirus by addressing each instance of coronavirus and treating it. You can't end malaria by treating each instance of malaria. In order to prevent and end those diseases, you actually have to stop them from occurring in the first place. Likewise with homelessness. We are amazing at housing veterans. We've, we've become really good at it over the years. And that inflow, right? How veterans continue to fall into homelessness is one of those things that we need to address and we need to overcome in order to get from 50% reduction to 100% reduction. And of course, some of the themes we've been hearing today and for the last several years, to be honest, all speak on the same thing, that there are there is structural inequities, structural racism throughout our country that continues to drive homelessness for Black, Alaska Native, Native American, and other people of color. It just is what it is. And so in order for us to do the thing that we want to do to end veteran homelessness and then end homelessness for everybody, we must, 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 must address structural racism and target those resources appropriately to achieve equitable outcomes. I'm gonna talk a little bit in the next section um, 
as, as Bev asks us another question about how specifically we're going to support you with that. But just know we are committed to this work alongside with you. So let's do it. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks, Sean. And um, so, yeah, another question uh, for the for the, the team of federal partners. And Lisa, I'll kick this one to you and learning a little bit more, you know, how your work um, at HUD and, and what you guys are doing, how you will support communities as they create racially equitable homelessness response systems. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're going to use all of the tools at our disposal, quite frankly, right? Like it's no secret to all of you who can hear April and I talk to you that SNAPS is going to incentivize uh, racial equity and data analysis in our competitions. You know, you saw it in the continuum of care competition. You know, we do it with, you know, the youth homelessness demonstration program. So you will, uh, you should expect to continue to see those types of uh, questions and are prodding you all through our competitions uh, to move communities, to move systems, to addressing racial equity. We're also going to continue to be thought partners with you all, right? Like we, we don't know everything, uh, anything, you know, on this issue, right? Like we are in conversation, we're in partnership with you all. We're looking to learn from you. You know, we're looking for you to help us lift up best practices, lift up innovations uh, that are happening around the country. So you can definitely count on us uh, to continue to be a thought partner. You can continue to count on us to provide technical assistance. Um, one of the things that we have been able to do through the pandemic and all of the, the COVID-19 you know, guidance and technical assistance that we've been getting out to the field, you know, you will notice that most of that is infused with equity, right? Like we can't, to Sean's point, you, you can't handle this sort of one portion at a time. You have to look at it as a system. And there's no way that we could rehouse folks in this pandemic. There's no way we could respond to this uh, situation without putting equity as the foundation. So in all of the technical assistance material that we have created as a result of the pandemic, you will see equity infused in that. You know, We have provided information to you all about increasing equity in your procurement processes, right? And making sure when you're thinking about you know, addressing the unsheltered crisis, making sure that we're lifting up the voices of folks who are currently experiencing homelessness. You know, what are they telling us? What interventions do they want to see? So you'll continue to see us model that, quite frankly, right? Where we're leaning into the expertise of persons with lived experience um, in the hopes that you all do that too. So you can count on us to provide to provide technical assistance. You can count on us to be a thought partner. You can count on us to use the tools that we have at our disposal, which includes uh, the competitions. And quite frankly, uh, you know, supporting this work and lifting up this work, you know, you can count on us to be accountable and acknowledge when we've made mistakes, um, acknowledge that we don't know everything and look to you all to continue to hold us accountable and help move us uh, when perhaps we're not moving as fast as we should be, uh, or maybe appear to be stagnant. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Right. And um, uh, I think everybody can can hear the hear the support from you as a federal partner, as well as I'm going to ask Sean the the same question around how the work within VA that you guys are doing, how you're going to continue to support communities as they uh, create racially equitable homelessness response systems. Yeah, thanks, Ben. So we're looking at a lot of different ways to actually embed racial equity into the day-to-day -day work that we do. And one of the mechanisms that we're approaching that from is a, basically a nationwide work group that is focused on rec racial equity and racial justice. We've actually just uh, are working towards expanding the size of a work group to include members of VA staff across the country. So we want to get a nice, wide, diverse swath because let me be on, totally honest. I was at that Tulsa uh, conference back in 2016, and it's taken me to the point of personal shame this long to get my act together. So recognizing that despite I'm a person of color growing up in largely white spaces, I don't know all the answers either. Answers either. And many of our team members, while we are absolutely committed, we need really, really good ideas. So one of the things that we're doing is expanding our scope of our work group, making sure that we're getting more voices, making sure that we're including voices of people with lived experience who are engaging our services as well, so that we can address and improve the services we provide globally on three main areas. 
first organizational wide where we look at our policies, our procedures, our program directives and handbooks, things like our NOFA processes and our grant process as well to make sure that they are not simply race neutral, but they are also anti-racist in the work that is being done. Second is to support staff in their day-to-day -day work as they navigate just working at the medical centers um, and whether they feel supported within their own racial identity or others. And then last, working with the veterans as well, making sure our staff are empowered to provide uh, anti-racist, essentially, case management and counseling and services so that they can better help veterans work through how racial trauma has impacted their instances of homelessness. Um, and we're also developing up an advisory and governance board to make sure that the work group itself stays on track. The last thing I want to mention, of course, is data. And we've heard data several times already, and data is a huge bit. We did a rough analysis a couple of years ago that took a look at how uh, veterans were interacting with our programs um, back in 2017 based off of race. I did a couple back of the map calculations off of that after, so nothing really like hyper vetted, but let's just say a lot of what we saw kind of bore out with the spark research and the research that you're seeing that veterans were accessing services at a rate disproportionate to how they were being enrolled in VA healthcare services, right? So that, that racial disparity in terms of veterans falling into homelessness is still there. But that was also national data, right? And it was national data looking at a specific snapshot of time. We wanna do go for, going forward is making sure that data is usable and broken down, not only continued by race and ethnicity, but other groups as well to make sure that all of our healthcare disparities are being addressed and to make sure that they're actually broken down by geography, because we recognize that certain areas have more work ahead of them than others, right? So those are things that we're exploring. And as Lisa said, we absolutely need you to keep us accountable, uh, whether that's you know, sending us emails, sending us quick nudges in the, in the guts, maybe kicks in the shin, but definitely keep us on the right track. We need you in this process. Uh, we don't have all the answers and we need you to make sure we stay on focus and stay on task. Um, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Sean, uh, Lisa, in April. And just, you know, again, I think on behalf of us, you know, as, as, as federal uh, partners, we are so um, appreciative of, of all of you on the call and the partnership with, with community um, solutions and keeping us, keeping us coming to the table so that we can be, be held um, accountable um, as well. And so on, on that note, I'm gonna uh, wrap us up and I'm turning it over to maybe Tamara or Anna. Yep, I'll take over from here. Thank you all so right. much. Um, my, I, it's just wonderful to hear from you all. Um, and how open and, uh, and willing you all are to help us in this, in this journey. Um, next, we are very proud to welcome nationally recognized human rights activist, public theologian and social critic, Ruby Sales as our keynote speaker today. A little bit about Ruby. Uh, Ruby Sales answered the call to social justice as a teenager at Tuskegee Institute, where she joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and worked on voter reg registration in Lowndes County, Alabama. She received a BA degree from Manhattanville College and attended graduate school at Princeton University. She received a Master's of Divinity degree from the Episcopal Divinity School, where she was an Absalon Jones Scholar. While there, she developed a reputation as a preacher and has preached at churches and cathedrals around the nation. After Divinity School, she founded and still directs a national nonprofit, the Spirit House Project. Today, she'll be speaking to us about the genesis and historical origins of homelessness and the importance of using language that defines the multidimensional and systemic nature of this issue, issue. She'll also be examining the historical intersection of homelessness and racism, while also discussing the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and that it has not been completely realized the impact of this pandemic on, on our homelessness um, issue. So um, Ruby Sales, thank you so much for being here today. We are all so excited to hear what you have to say, to listen to you and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for introducing me and welcoming me to this great circle 
of which we're all a part. I'd like for us to begin this part of our conversation with each other to just take a moment, take a deep breath and ask a fundamental question. What does it mean to be fully human in a capitalist technocracy where very few lives matter and black lives matter the least of all lives? And how does that relate to the question of homelessness? Let's just think about that for a moment because we no longer live in, in an industrial society. We live in a capitalist technocracy and our analysis must be contextualized within the, the, the shift of the economic world that we live in today. So I'd just like for you to think about that and then we'll come back to, to talking about it. What does it mean to live in a capitalist technocracy where very few lives matter and black lives matter the least of all lives? That is a very important question in a global technocracy where 30% of white men own 95% of the global wealth and resources. And 70% of us must figure out how to divide and share without killing each other only 5% of their leftovers. How does that then impact the way in which we engage with the question of homelessness where we are forced to only have access to 5% of the world's resources. What does it mean to talk about homelessness in a capitalist technocracy where human labor is becoming obsolete and, and whiteness does not carry the same currency in terms of the labor force that it once did in an industrial society? And what does it mean within that context when black bodies and brown bodies are no longer needed as being part of the labor force? How does that impact not only the contemporary issues of homelessness, but the future question of homelessness? How do we talk about homelessness in a 21st century capitalist technocracy where human suffering No, no longer matters, or if it does matter, it has become an industry. How is it that we talk about homelessness in a global capitalist, te capitalist technocracy in a virtual world where intimacy and our knowing each other is being decimated? These questions must form our conversation about homelessness. And we must bring to our conversation about homelessness, hindsight, history, insight, the present, and our speculations about the future. And I've been thinking about what is it, what, what are the, what is the evidence, the data that we have before us as we begin to talk, as we talk about this question this morning? I think we have 400 years of data, 400 years of 500 years of data that began with the doctrine of discovery and the invasion of this country by Europeans who precipitated one of the greatest holocausts in this country that ended up in displacement, the homelessness and the genocide of indigenous people. And we can, we can trace the homelessness of indigenous people back to the doctrine of discovery and all of what came out within that, within that doctrine of discovery. We also can look at homelessness that within the doctrine of discovery also came land gra grabs, 
theft, land theft, land greed. We can place that, that, that has the history, the history that is very clear. 400 years of that, we see that manifested today, the continuation of that history in gentrification, urban renewal that happened in the 60s. I'm thinking, I was thinking this morning, as I said that, I was thinking, I'm thinking about the, the young, the, the refugees, the black and brown refugees who are being held in sites of terror that we euphemistically call detention centers. They are homeless. And what is the, what is the connection between their homelessness and the Monroe Doctrine where America declared that it had the right to the resources and the land of, of, of people who lived in Latin America. We see that played out today that, that the people who are homeless in this country who are held in those sites of terror are descendants of those peasants who were victims of the land grab and the genocide of Europeans in those lands. What am I trying to say here? What does it mean to talk about equity in a capitalist technocracy where democracy is rapidly being replaced by an authoritarian government? How is it that we can talk about equity within the context of white supremacy? How do you get to equity when white supremacy is antithetical to equity? Equity. How is it that you talk about equity without talking about democratization? And democracy has always been a contested territory in America. It has always been a stream that runs deeply in this country, all the way back to the doctrine of discovery, all the way back to enslavement, all the way back to, to segregation, all the way back to sterilization. There, there have been too many streams in this country. How is it that we talk about equity without talking about the system that, that perpetuates inequity? And how is it that we call injustices and uh, disparities? What about the language that we speak? How does, how does our language further perpetuate and hides the brutal nature of the system that we think that, that we say that we're trying to improve? I was, let me just digress a moment and just speak very candid. One of the things that the white supremacist power does is that it perpetuates in white people always a fear of being unsafe. And, the, and all sorts of crimes against people of color are committed in the name of, keep, of, home, of keeping white people secure. So we do this work and bring that, 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 that desire to be safe and the need to be coddled to the work, we have to ask ourselves, we can't stand to hear about the, the racism, if we can't stand to talk about it. How is it that we think people who are dealing with the feel, how can they deal, how can they stand to feel it? If we can't stand to hear about it, have you ever thought about how they feel to live it? Nobody's out there coddling them. Nobody's using their power to protect them and to make sure that they are not uncomfortable. There is no comfort in doing justice work because it's not just unsettling the status quo, it's also interrogating our assumptions about ourselves and about others. It's really important that we just really interrogate the values and the assumptions that we bring to this work. We, 
we cannot afford to count. This is not, this is serious work. We're dealing with the human life. We're dealing with people who are considered disposable waste. And there's nothing safe. There's nothing kind. There's nothing gentle about being a disposable waste. And so I would suggest that one of the things that we need to start doing is to eliminate the indoctrinated sense of, white, that of whiteness that, it, that we need to be safe. And that, and that our desire to be safe, or our, that we can't, that if you talk about injustice, then I'm gonna get hurt because you're hurting my feelings. First of all, when we understand systemic injustice, it has nothing to do with a person. It's not a personal indictment. It's not about a bad or a good person. It's about a terrible system. So we're critiquing a system. We're not leveling charges against individuals. That leads us down nowhere when we do that. And so that we've got to understand, first of all, what is racism? Racism is a system. It's not about good or bad people. I can have a hundred good people in my life, but that doesn't eliminate racism. And so that when you talk about homelessness, it is not about individual behavior. It's about systemic assaults. It's about violence. Homelessness is really violence against a person's human dignity. It continues the whole history of violence against people of color in this country. And whether you say, and, and so that these, these are questions that we must grapple with in the 21st century. How is it that we resolve the question of homelessness with 5% of resources available to us? And what does it mean? We, we talk about homelessness as if it's still an inner city crisis. How do we connect our conversation with homelessness to the fact that black and brown people are, are being pushed out of cities into sites of rural desolation where they do not have access to housing, food, jobs, or even transportation or hospital or health care? So we're building up new sites of homelessness in the 21st century capitalist society. What 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 resources are we using to really begin to address the fallout of, of gentrification and the, and the rural poverty that's being accumulated in these sites of terror. And we must begin to deal with them because if we don't, we're gonna have another race war for people competing with the meager resources that are there. The other thing that I think about when I think about today's world, I was gonna talk about history, but I realized that it's really important for us to understand that we live in a technocracy. And to really ask ourselves, what does that mean in terms of the work that we do? And what is the data that we already have before us? 400 years of data that tells us that, that, that homelessness is tied into captivity, dispersion, dislocation, land grab. When we think about land grab, what do we see? We see the whole movement in the 80s of scattered housing and the decimation of public housing and the, and, the, and the stuff of, the, of that land by real estate developers, because that was prime land in many of those cities. Public housing was located on prime land and that precipitated a wave of homelessness. And so we've seen examples of this right before our eyes. And, and the question is, what does it mean that black and brown people have borne the burden of whiteness as it comes as it pertains to homelessness. 
these are questions that, that we must put on the table. These are questions that I go around the country and rarely do I hear people ever asking these questions. Rarely do I hear us asking, what does it mean to democratize this country? What does it mean to share resources? What does it mean to make sure that we have a redistribution of resources? And how is it that we can fight homelessness in a world where we only have 5% resources available to us? And how is the disposability of human life tied into a capitalist technocracy where very few lives matter? How do we make a connection between the disposability of black and brown lives with the COVID-19 virus and disposability of black lives in terms of homelessness? And then we need to expand our conversations. We need to speak in tongues. We need to also begin to understand that there's a homelessness issue developing in white America in a capitalist society where human labor is becoming obsolete. That, that is a critical growing problem. And so to talk about white homelessness is not to denigrate the reality of black and brown homelessness. It means that we must stop dealing in dualisms that we must speak simultaneously or multidimensionally about issues that, 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 that face a human condition in a 21st century society. The prison industrial complex is another instance of, of, of a site of homelessness. What is the correlation between the, prison, the separation of children in the prison industrial complex from their families and the separation of, of, of black and brown refugees from their families. And then to have, to have these children be homeless in foster care where they have no, no stable homes. It means that you cannot do this work unless you begin to critically ask the question, what does it mean for us to live in a culture of whiteness? And what have been the manifest, systemic manifestation, manifestations of a culture of whiteness? And what does it mean to try to within a neo-colonial model? What does it mean to try to do this within a neo-colonial model? in a nonprofit industrial complex where a great deal of the money is used not to solve the problems, but to maintain a middle-class workforce. And what does it mean for us to benefit off of the backs of people who are suffering? These are hard questions, but they must be asked. These are very hard questions. Unless we begin to, to go deep into these issues, we will not solve the problem of homelessness because homelessness is a systemic evil that is one of the central pillars of whiteness. And, it's, and until we can deal with whiteness, we will not have a, a democratized system and we will still try to treat the person and not the system. And we will pathologize the person. We will say it's because they are on drugs, it's because they're mentally ill. Many people are mentally ill and on drugs and they're not homeless. Many people have trauma in their lives and they're not homeless. So why are black and brown people, why are those, path, those terms always used? to describe the circumstances of, of systemic assaults against Black people. We must be clear that when we do that, we participate in a system of pathologizing Black people, of pathologizing suffering and criminalizing systemic injustice. And so where we are today, is that we must begin to develop a new paradigm 
They talk about human suffering in a capitalist technocracy where human labor is becoming less and less irrelevant and where human suffering is becoming more and more prevalent, where human disposability is becoming more and more evident, where access to life resources that every human being needs in order to live a dignified life is becoming less and less accessible. How is it that we began to make a connection between the data that we repeat? For example, we're constantly saying that, that, that these small group of elites own so much of the world's resources, but rarely do we make a connection between that reality and the injustices that we are trying to resolve. If you only have 5% of the resources available, what does that mean concretely? What, what is the prognosis for ending systemic injustice? What then should be your public policy emphasis? What is it that you should be demanding and asking for? When I, I had the shock of my life when I was in Atlanta and I was working with some Black Lives Matter young people. And like many adults, I was in my own world in many ways. And I did not, understand what was happening on a daily basis with young people until I began to really uh, invite Black Lives young people into my house and we began to talk. And I discovered that several of them were homeless, sleeping in their cars, not money to buy food. One, and the rest of them were one step away from being homeless. What does it mean to be a leader who's homeless, who's sleeping in their cars, and adults are totally, totally unaware and unconcerned. What does it mean to be a young person in a society where you can't even afford to begin to think about a home because of the, the greed and the devaluing of human life in a society where young people are becoming more and more homeless. I would say that homelessness among young people is one of the most invisible issues of our, of our genera of this generation. And we need to begin to address that. I take in young people often just to give them a start in life because they're homeless. And these are not people that you say are on drugs. These, these are not people that people criminalize and say this are used to just their conditions to justify the assaults. These are students, these are young people working to try to better the society. And they too, like the people who are dismissed and criminalized, they share one common reality. They are black. That's the common stigma in this society. And the other common stigma is poverty. And the other common stigma is gender. And the other common stigma is youth, that we don't think about young people as being homeless, children. What does it mean that children grow up without a home? And what does it mean that these children are mainly black and brown? It means that the lives of black and brown children as attested to today are seen, do not matter. And they are not seen as investments, they're seen as threats and their lives must, and they must be destroyed because they pose a danger to the future and the efficacy of white supremacy.
these are very hard issues, but you cannot solve hunger homelessness unless you begin to ask, what does it mean? What is the history that surrounds the meaning of being a young black or brown person in a society where blackness and brown The, and so what I would ask each of you today is to go deeper, make a connection between your head and your hearts. Your hearts are in the right place, but I really challenge you to begin to contextualize your, your, your solutions in your discourse beyond the question of equity to asking the question, how is it that we democratize all aspects of American society in a capitalist technocracy where, where the, in a change in demographic that's, predominant, that's going to be predominantly black and brown and where in a white supremacist world, that's a threat. And so how is it that you separate homelessness out from the growing fascism in this country based on white fear about a growing black and brown demographic and the whole threat to white power and white nationalist power? And then I would ask you to ask to say, to really, began to develop a discourse in the 21st century that also begins to deal with the homelessness that's growing and developing in white America. Because I predict if we don't begin to handle these questions, people will turn their rage against each other and we will see a racial bloodbath in the 21st century that out equals the, the red summers and the massacres that began in this country between, between 1868 and 1900, the white massacres of black communities. I believe that we can do this, but it's not easy and it's not comfortable and, 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 you can't, and we must not focus on whether we feel secure our job is to make sure that other people feel as secure as we'd like to feel, to be able to empathize with other people's insecurity and to ask ourselves, if we have a hard time talking about the issue, what must people feel who live it? What must people feel who live it? I was going to ask, do we have time for questions? I guess I talked too much. No, Ruby, you were, you were fine. And I think uh, we have just one question come through. I asked in the chat and I had some others plus one this question, which was essentially, and so the question was asked by Tammy Nofel Green, how do we begin to move away from being a capitalist technocracy? Or maybe another way to put that is, how do we resist what capitalist technocracy is? moving us towards that might not be good directions how do we how do we respond to that first of all i think we respond to it by understanding it i begin to have conversations that update our discourse and, and and stop using words like inner cities which no longer exist because gentrification Forty-six thousand african americans were pushed out of new york in 2000, 2016 48,000 from Chicago. There are no more inner cities are becoming things of the past. So we must begin to uproot, unglue ourselves from social media. And we must become the, the legitimizer and the constructors of our discourses. We must construct our discourses. And we cannot, and we must study. And we must be very, very, very intentional about asking the right questions as we, as we, that drive our data. 
because we can collect data all we want to, but data is never separate from the questions that we're asking. What are we looking for? And I, I just really believe that we have enough data right before us to begin to solve the issue of homelessness if we will take up the data and use it wisely and honestly. And it's not, some, it's not instant gratification. And it's not about achieving the big victory with one gulp. Movements to, for social change build on small victories. So set a table of small victories. And every time you have a victory, celebrate that victory. Because if you don't, you'll begin to feel hopeless and you'll despair. For example, today is a victory that you've gathered all of these people. We're having this conversation and we're willing to go deeper into the question. So this is a victory. It doesn't matter that we haven't solved the problem. It doesn't matter that we won't solve the problem. It means that we're in the process and that, that the mere fact that you organized this event to, to bring us together in community, in a virtual world where community no longer exists and intimacy is decimated. Your desire to build, a, to, to operate within a community to talk about this issue is a victory. So in order to defeat, defeat a capitalist technocracy, we have to move away from instant gratification, the expectation of instant gratification, mm. and begin to set agendas where we celebrate with, our, with ourselves and with our community our victories and be realistic about our defeats. Great, and uh, maybe just one question to close on here, Ruby, and then I'll hand it back to Anna to wrap us up. This is from Brenda O'Connell, and maybe you've already started to answer this question, but her question is, what gives you hope that we can begin to create a more equitable world? What gives you hope? Well, I guess, what, let me just say, I've gotta be honest. I don't look for an equitable world. What I look for is a democratized world. And what gives me hope is that there's hope in history. And it gives me, and the, and the hope is, is that once upon a time, there were great empires, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, and those empires are pale images of themselves today. And the power of the people and the impulse for freedom still exists. And so it is in ordinary people the lives of ordinary people and their unbroken impulse of freedom and human dignity give me hope. I find hope in that. Thank you, Ruby. It's so wonderful to have you with us. Thanks for challenging us, for lighting fires that we can keep burning here with the questions and provocations that you gave us. Um, so appreciate your message and having you here with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And I really do appreciate the work that you're doing. And I, I just really would like to just say, celebrate your victories. Determine, be determined to, to move beyond your defeats and never give up hope. And always ask the question, if it's difficult for you who are doing this work, how must it feel for people who are living the work that you're doing? Thank you. All right. And Tamara, I will uh, hand it back to you to wrap us up. Thank you so much, um, Ruby Sales. That was so incredible. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Garen. Um, we're going to get ready for a 15 minute break. But before we do that, I want to send you all something in the chat. Um, so native-land.ca is an online pro uh, platform where users can interact with maps of indigenous territories, treaties and languages and locate themselves in their favorite places on the map. Um, fundamentally, the maps aim to visualize the complexity and diversity of indigenous peoples, nations and cultures across the Americas, Australia and increasingly the world. So that uh, non-indigenous and indigenous people alike can increase their understanding and knowledge 
of the breadth and depth of indigenous history in these places. There are many questions embedded in the use of these maps, such as what time periods are represented, who counts as indigenous and is therefore represented on this map? Why is the rest of the world not mapped? And why are there overlapping territories in some areas and not others? Uh, why do the names of nations sometimes differ so much from the common names that Western culture is familiar with? And what does it mean to say we are on native land? The map and the questions it raises are designed to encourage you to engage with the history of both indigenous, I can't ever say this word, indigeneity <laughs> and colonialism. So users can reach out to indigenous nations through the links provided and try to learn a little of the local language or just dive into the history. And in any case, the deeper purpose of native, of, uh, native land is to plant a seed of consciousness into anyone that uses this website um, that will cause them to think more critically and comprehensively about indigenous history, especially where they live and play. So if you click on that link, you're able to put in your zip code or any zip code that you would like, and you can, you can see the different uh, territories that are around there and just play around with it. And uh, it's very illuminating. Um, and then I think Garen has a quick update and then we'll do our, uh, we'll go on our break. Um, so yeah, the next session is the Slaying Foundation session. It is, it's also on this line. Um, and the um, I, I just one quick update about the session this afternoon where that I mentioned um, you'll you'll have an invite from um, someone on our team. There are a lot of different names <laughs> that our team members are using for that session. But if you have an invite from someone on our team for three thirty to five o'clock, that's the right one. Um, it might be called something different than what's in the agenda. But yeah, that's the invite. Thank you. And then um, the next session is just going to be on the same line. So you can probably just mute and take off your video. And then we'll meet back here in 15 minutes. I'm trying to do quick math. So 1051. All right. See you at 1051, everyone. Hey Nate, can you move the slide to the to the um, survey, the evaluation? Thanks, Nate. So yeah, everybody, if you if you're still here, um, please tell us what you think. Here's a QR code and a link for the evaluation. Thanks so much. <laughs> 